Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone Podcast. Today, I have an amazing guest. His name is Dr. Jeff Karp, and he's a professor of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He's also a principal faculty member at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and an affiliate faculty member at the Broad Institute and at the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. But I'm just getting warmed up. Wait till you hear his background. This is a real, this, this guy's a real special guy. He works in the field of drug delivery, medical devices, stem cell therapies, and tissue adhesives. He's published over 125 peer-reviewed papers with over 18,500 citations and has given over 300 invited lectures. He has over 100 issued or pending national and international patents. Several technologies developed in his lab have led to multiple products currently being funded. And he's launched seven companies, raised over $300 million in funding. And the technologies include high-tech skincare, tissue adhesives, 3D printing, biomedical devices, immunologylation, and biologically responsive materials, small molecule regenerative therapies. We talked about aging therapies. We talked about stem cells in the interview, and also he's, uh, hearing loss uh, cannabinoid therapeutics, biomedical devices to improve child safety, GI coding targeted, aluminum coding for bioengineering. Uh, he's received over 50 awards and honors. Boston Magazine recently recognized CARP as one of the 11 Boston doctors making medical breakthroughs. And he's also one of the top innovators in the world. And three members of his lab have subsequently received this award from MIT Technology Review Magazine. So Dr. Karp is is really quite unbelievable. I, I spent a lot of time talking to him about how he builds his teams and how he empowers his teams to really take on these projects. I mean, what he's done is he's bridged academia and entrepreneurship, and that's no small feat with the co-founding of, of six companies from really an academic, really, how do you get research out into the world so you can you can really impact lives? We talked about mentor development. One of the biggest things that he targets is building mentors and finding mentors. And he is actively always meeting people. And he talks about this and why the power of meeting new people every two weeks. And also we talk about reducing problems to their essence. And what I love is when I hear scientists talk about how they really take a lot of really big focus is radical simplicity in, in the art and discipline of reducing problems to their essence so they can solve problems in the in, in useful practical solutions to real world problems. So this is a, a, a really, really fun interview with a really a world impact leader in medicine and bringing cutting edge therapies to market with a team, a team of people dedicated to really changing the world. So with this, I want to welcome you to my great conversation with Dr. Jeff Karp. Welcome you to the show today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, I'm very, very excited to have you on the show. And as my listeners have already heard about your biography and your your history, I'm really interested in maybe starting with your entrepreneurship and your Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that your science, your focus on science and solving problems you mentioned in your TED Talk, you didn't really anticipate. You thought that was going to be the hardest part of getting your ideas and your solutions out into the market. But you end up talking about how the actual hard part was actually convincing others and, and sort of the other part of the entrepreneurial journey was equally as challenging. I was wondering if you could spend a couple minutes talking about that. Absolutely. I think, you know, in, in, in many ways, it's almost 
every academic's dream to have impact in society in some form or another. And I think that there certainly is impact to be had in, in publishing papers and, and contributing to to new knowledge. But I think, you know, also being part of using that knowledge to do something useful is incredibly exciting. And I think that in academia, we really don't don't have any formal training on the business side, typically, you know, especially, you know, us biomedical engineers or bioengineers. And, and you know, we constantly are talking about how what we're doing is useful, but actually, you know, putting to use the the technologies and the knowledge that we're generating is a completely different world. And I think that, you know, based on on some of the mentors that I've had in my life and my PhD and my postdoc, you know, they all were very entrepreneurial and, and they were all starting companies and interacting with companies. And I just saw through these types of experiences, the potential impact that one could have by dedicating to a career in science, um, but then also by really putting a lot of effort into trying to push things out of the laboratory. And so, um, you know, I've been trying, you know, when I, I set up my lab in July of 07, after coming out of a, a postdoc um, from Bob Langer's lab, really trying hard to figure out how could I continue the mission that I had learned, you know, from my mentors about the potential of translating academic discoveries in, into uh, new companies and ideally quickly turning that into products for patients. One of the things actually I'll say that I think is one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life is that when I, around the time when I started my faculty position, I realized what I wanted to do, but I, I didn't, I knew I didn't have the experience or, or tools to really do it. And so what I committed to was meeting somebody new in the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Boston every two to three weeks. And I've continued to do that over the past you know, 12, 13, 14 years or so. And this is like, you know, reimbursement, regulatory experts, uh, entrepreneurs, people in companies, manufacturing experts, and really trying to develop relationships with people. And and that has served multiple purposes that have, have helped me to, to stay on track for the mission of trying to bring new therapies to patients as quickly as possible. You know, I find that fascinating, the, the mentors that you mentioned. So, you originally, you mentioned some mentors within the academic arena, but those mentors were also entrepreneurial. Well, how do you go about nurturing and finding and developing these mentors? Because I, I often say in my innovation group that we're the, and again, I don't know how we measure this, but uh, it's been said that we're the average of the five people we hold closest to us in the area that we're looking to expand and grow in. And uh, how do you continue to challenge yourself with finding mentors that, that help you think in new ways? I think part of it is developing in some ways, I think it's almost, you know, developing a passion to to have mentors in your life. You know, it's one thing to, to say it's good to have a mentor, but I think unless you're really excited about it and, and really motivated to have one, it you know, there's a certain activation energy required to really seek out, I would say, mentors who are a good fit for you. And and I think one of the best definitions of mentors um, that I've come across is someone whose hindsight can become your foresight, you know? And I think along with that goes, you know, someone who actually sees your potential and almost treats you as if you're at that level, you know, so they can help kind of pull you up to that level. So I think in an ideal world, you know, your boss or your supervisor or, you know, who, who's ever kind of overseeing what you're doing would be your mentor. I think a lot of the time that doesn't end up being being the case um, because, you know, not everyone's really passionate about mentorship. And so to me, kind of recognizing early on that it was going to be a critical part of my life and that there were things I wanted to do, but just didn't have the capabilities to do certain things. And I, I knew I needed to work with more, you know, kind of see a mentor as like a life coach. And so just by becoming passionate about finding mentors, I think that that actually played a bit, really big role. And then the other part of it, I think, was just really seeking out people where the relationship seemed right and people were, were taking an interest in what I was doing. And at the same time, maybe they could see that their advice and their time with me would be put to good use because I would take what they said very seriously and really try to implement these things in my life. And so, you know, that so having mentors has really been a big, big part of my life. And I'd say, you know, the other the other thing is that, you know, I'm a really big believer that anytime you want to learn a new skill or become proficient in a new area, 
the best way to do it is to find an environment where people are practicing those skills and then submerge yourself in that environment, even if you have no expertise or skills, you know, in, in that um, at the very beginning. And so that's also been something that I've tried to do is really seek out environments where people were practicing skills that I just really wanted to have because I knew it would would help me in my path. And were the the mentors that that you were particularly successful that helped you? I mean, one of the things you mentioned is you you seem to have a big reason why you want a mentor or or surround yourself with mentors. Is part of that the natural strength you had in the sciences and the need to shore up skills on the entrepreneurial side of the fence? Or did you find that you wanted mentors in both continuums? You wanted it both in areas that you were naturally strong and also areas that that you were naturally needing to develop more skills with. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know if I have have a really sort of linear answer, I'd say, because I, I it's almost like, you know, I feel like it was just like a growing passion, kind of a feeling inside and almost like an awareness of what were my strengths and what were my weaknesses. You know, I had a lot of support growing up from my mom to, you know, I kind of struggled a lot early on in, in school. And that support that I got from, you know, my parents really helped to instill confidence in me that, you know, there was something that I could do that would be be useful. And I think that through the various struggles I had kind of early on is it in my in my childhood, I think seeking out other sort of levels or, or different areas of support, I, I just knew was was going to be helpful for me to try and, you know, unleash the potential that I thought I had. And, you know, this this process, I feel, is just very iterative. There's no sort of like, you can't say, you know, that, you know, you want this person to be like your mentor and it will just happen. I feel like it, it's just, you know, having lots of interactions with lots of people and just getting a sense for when there's a good fit. So I think that was to me like kind of a big, a big part of it. And then the other part of it was as I went on and in the early parts of my career, I just, I realized that what I wanted to do was combine you know, engineering with medicine in a way to develop new therapies. I really didn't know how to do that, but I, I saw others do it. And that was very inspiring to me that it was was possible. And so then I started to really just start seeking out environments that I could submerse myself in to learn those skills. And so, you know, I'd say there it was more about not having a specific plan or knowing how to advance, but just knowing that that's what I needed to do and really wanted to do. And it was kind of developing that passion and then just seeking out interactions with people to find the right conditions to fulfill that. So that makes sense. So that you, you had this very strong passion and then really that was kind of the guiding North Star. And then in the journey towards that objective, you you were learning from others as you went that you pulled into your vortex, so to speak. Um, exactly. Help. Yeah. And, you know, I just I feel like everyone has so many different experiences in their lives and you can't you can't really it's, it's hard to ever appreciate like how different other people's experiences are are have been and the lessons that they've learned and the strategies the kind of like the life strategies that they that they have and that they use you know on a daily basis and so i kind of came to this appreciation that i could learn a lot from everybody and that every interaction i had there's like an opportunity to learn something you know about myself or about like a strategy that they were using that that maybe i could try and experiment with in my own life and so I'd say throughout my life, I, I've, I've experimented a lot, not just in, in the laboratory, the research that we do, but also just in, in the strategies that I've tried to develop to, to maximize, you know, productivity and impact that I potentially could have in the world. Well, there, there is a, a very much a vulnerability and a, and a humility that comes through mentorship because you're essentially acknowledging just by embarking on the on the journey of, of learning from others that you don't have all the answers. And I found that myself as I've searched different people that have achieved different things. It's uh, you, you're by definition saying, OK, how is someone else? Uh, what's their lens of reality as compared to mine? And maybe there is another two or three, four different options to to achieve this. And and that it sort of leads me to my next because I think the humility of really, really smart people that have done quite a lot you also talk about the value of that's not the end game. The end game is actually simplifying. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about 
what value your lab and your thinking and, and uh, simplicity has taken and how that started and how you deploy that type of mindset uh, in a very, very complex environment? I think simplicity has, it's become a very important topic in my laboratory and I'd say, you know, kind of broadly in my life. I, it was, it wasn't always that way. There were some notable moments, I would say, early on in my faculty position, kind of where I, I learned lessons, I'd say, you know, even the hard way um, that really kind of helped me change my thinking or, or, or get to a, a different level of thinking. And that was, I was always curious about why so many academics in the biomaterials or bioengineering community were developing, you know, seemingly very promising therapies and, and technologies, but very few things were actually being translated to the clinic. And, you know, read these papers and in the abstract or introduction conclusion, you, you know, you kind of say this is going to be useful for X, Y, and Z, but, but then nothing really happens. Nothing advances to clinical trials. And, you know, I was always curious about why that was. So early on, my the initial project that I focused on in my, my laboratory was in the area of stem cell therapy, and we were interested in trying to find ways to modify or manipulate stem cells outside the body where we could control the surface. So when we infuse them back into the body, just like, let's say, intravenously, that the surface of the cells could recognize signatures on blood vessels so they would slow down and stop you know depending on where they were in the body so it was almost like this this gps system and and we actually got it up and running and i was pretty excited about it so we could do intravenous infusion of stem cells and have them localize or target a site of inflammation just by traveling through the bloodstream and and through actively interacting with the blood vessels at the site of inflammation and um, so i went to a local venture capitalist you know, kind of really excited about this. You know, I thought we had done something really great. And we started talking and I went through the data and they said, you know, this is this is really interesting work and, and you really achieved something nice. And then when we started talking about how I got to this process, you know, it was a five step process. And so they took a look at it and they said, you know, you know, while the data looks really interesting, this is going to be extremely difficult to manufacture because there's so many different steps. You're going to have to do quality control at each step. And in our experience, the, the more steps you have, the greater the risk of not being able to fill certain quality criteria and things can really break down. And they said, you know, if you really want to impact patients' lives, you need to uh, come up with uh, simpler technologies. And so I went back to my lab and, and I was, you know, frustrated and, and, you know, kind of disappointed, maybe a bit angry. I was like, ah, oh, you know, why didn't I think of this before? And, you know, I really thought deeply about that feedback, internalized it and realized that, you know, when I started to, you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel like when you learn a hard lesson, you kind of have a new lens at looking at almost everything. And so as I started to look at other technologies that people around me were developing and things going on in my lab, I realized that, that yes, like majority things out there were just too complicated and there was lots of opportunities for simplification. And so that kind of set me on this mission of how can we simplify everything we do um, right from the beginning so that we're not, you know, spending years developing something and then trying to simplify it at the end, but actually making simplicity part of the design criteria for the solution. Yeah, because in your speech, it, you mentioned the radical simplicity is the art and discipline of reducing a problem to its essence so you can solve it quickly and then develop practical and can be practical in the real world. And mm -hmm. And so you also mentioned about these deep nuances in thinking. And I, and I think that's the challenge I find with sort of technology these days is infinite growing complexity. So we often are wondering, okay, well, we're developing these different tools to help with complexity, like uh, different tools that are automated, like machine learning and AI and different algorithms to help us. But there's a natural human governor of like, okay, how can I take this and make it into a more simpler outcome and then so maybe you can talk about that with your lab and the processes that you're developing because I think that's a conversation people want to know is how I can be innovative and how I can have a team that innovates even though you might be the one that pours the gasoline on the fire I think my listeners would be really interested in knowing how your process works in your labs for making uh, these breakthroughs or the structure of a process yeah yeah I think I think what um 
so a lot, a lot of this has just been really like highly iterative and 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 really trying to you know actually there was there was another realization that I made as I as I was thinking through simplicity early on, which was that it doesn't just apply to the technology side of things. It's not just about you know trying to to just think technology, but rather it, it almost encompassed the entire spectrum of translation. So even, you know, in terms of how the problem was defined and what I started realizing as I was, you know, and I'm, I'm an engineer by training and I think an engineer in many ways is a degree in problem solving. And, and that has led me, you know, in combination with some of the things that uh, some of the experiences I had earlier in my life to really focus on the process and really try to understand, you know, how altering the process can, can really impact the product at the end. And when I started thinking about the process of, of innovation, and by the way, I, I feel in, innovation is something that can only be retrospectively defined. You know, innovation is a, is a very practical word, meaning that, you know, you've actually done good or contributed positively to society. So you can't really call something innovative until you've actually done that. And actually, you know, that that definition in and of itself, you know, kind of helps us as well, because, you know, we can get enamored very quickly with some creative thing we come up with, but but that may have no potential to help help patients. And so in terms of thinking about the whole spectrum, what I realized is that the problem needs to be thought through at the beginning. And the problem isn't just a, a biological problem. It's not just a medical problem, but it's actually commercial problem as well, like the business side of how you're actually going to bring this forward and get investors and and really make this into a viable product is is part of the problem definition that needs to be considered right from the beginning as well as the manufacturing and the regulatory strategy and so this almost like this this sense that I, it was almost ingrained in my mind and and that that the problem was really just you know, biological problem or a medical problem. And if you succeeded in curing the mouse or, or the, the animal, that that would be enough to bring something forward. And then what I realized is that I needed to do a lot more critical thinking early on about the entire translational spectrum. And so that that's kind of been a big part of, you know, the radical simplicity approach is, is not just simplifying the technology, but but really trying to get at the heart of the problem. And I've realized that often the way that others have defined problems is that there's actually more that we can do, that there's more to the problem than than we can read in a, in a paper or have a conversation with someone else. And so often what we'll do is we'll conduct experiments to better understand the problem and then to gain ideally some insights that may help guide us in a direction that no one's gone gone before. So that's kind of been a big part of you know, this radical simplicity paradigm for me in my laboratory. And then there's also, you know, a lot that I've tried to do in my lab to maximize a culture which would really enable people to explore their curiosities and have somewhat of a, a limitless type environment, which I think has also been very important, you know, in combination with that. Could you talk about that a little more about the culture part? Because as you mentioned earlier, it's not all about the technology and you culture for me talks to people. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on culture and supporting these big moonshots that you're developing? So, yeah, so culture is is something that I feel like, you know, is it, just, you know, you, you hear often how important it is to have the right team and, and the right people. And that makes a lot of sense. But to me, that the challenge is how do you actually execute on that? And that ends up being a lot more challenging and, and complicated than just talking about, you know, having having the right team. And so I've tried really hard through my career to figure out what is it really about productive and impactful, successful cultures where people really gravitate towards and, and, and you know, what are some of the elements of that? And then experimenting, you know, in my laboratory with with ways of of trying to empower people and, and to really create a culture where, where people, you know, go all in. And some of the aspects of that, I feel one is like just hiring and, and bringing people to my laboratory. I read this article early on about how when you interview people, you tend to hire yourself. And, you know, I was like, really? Like, I don't know. And then the next time I, I was interviewing someone, I realized like that that's exactly what I was trying to do and that I was judging people based on whether they aligned with who I was and how I operated. And so I quickly realized that I needed to engage other people in my laboratory to be, you know, major parts of the hiring process. 
And what I also realized is that, you know, I'm not necessarily the best judgment of character. I kind of look at everybody and I see a lot of potential and and I have trouble kind of saying no, you know, sometimes to, to people. And what I realized there's actually people in my laboratory who are exceptional at judging character and who's going to fit into the lab and really create a lot of synergies. And so the people in my lab can actually veto me on, you know, bringing someone in. So, you know, if I'm excited about someone and they say no, then, then no is the answer. And I feel like a big part of that is if the people, you know, in the lab are, excited about someone coming, you know, if they, if they have a say, they're likely not to pick someone who's going to be competitive. You know, they're, they're more likely to pick people who can synergize with what they're doing and bring their science or their projects to a new level. And then when, when we set someone into the lab, there's this excitement that that person's coming. And, and I think that that's really contributed to a important part of the, the culture that we have in the laboratory. Another thing that I've tried to do is really focus on empowerment. And so, you know, trying to figure out ways where people could pretty much own their projects, that it's not my project, that's their project, and that it's not an environment where people really work for me. It's an environment that it's almost like the opposite. It's like I'm working for the people in the, in the laboratory you know, trying to create like more of like a lateral environment, which has been a challenge, but something that I've really worked worked hard on. And I see, you know, example of empowerment is, you know, part of it, I think, is dealing with ego. And I, what I realized through, you know, trying to really become self-aware is that in general, I think when faced with certain types of decisions, ego jumps out and tries to make the decision, you know, kind of protect thyself type of mentality. And so what I've tried to do is prevent that by thinking about, well, if I made the opposite decision, would that actually harm me? Would that lead to a positive outcome? And and in many cases, you know, kind of going against that instinct of protect thyself, I've realized that that I can really create more of a win-win environment. And that if you create an environment where you really appreciate what others are doing and you know, try not to limit them and try to give them, you know, ability to own their projects and empower them that there people are more likely to go all in. And you see, you know, even these, you know, very young, young individuals who quickly develop a steep learning curve and, and their professional development really skyrockets. One other thing, you know, I'll mention that that I've done, which I think is has really been helpful is in my laboratory, we do these three minute presentation competitions. And so we've been doing this for probably the last like 10 years or so, where everyone in the lab has an opportunity to present for three minutes. And they ideally present on something that they're curious about or passionate about, doesn't have to be science related at all. And then what we do is after each presentation, um, everyone in the lab can provide feedback on what they liked about the presentation and what they thought needs improvement. And then what happens is that everyone votes on who gave the best presentation and who gave the best feedback to improve kind of quality of the presentations. And that's just been incredible because it creates, again, it's like towards this lateral environment. It really you know, facilitates people getting in touch with their curiosities and their passions. And then it's an amazing thing because people like, you know, we had a guy present with a, he had a guitar that he was playing and his slides were going on in the background. Someone who was into break dancing talked about break dancing and did like a break dance. Someone did a a rap on the various hamburger restaurants in Boston because they just like, you know, they like to do these raps. And then someone actually recently, a few weeks ago, someone presented on how that song, the baby shark song is so addictive. And, um, you know, she has a young daughter. And so she presented on that. And again, I feel like that just, it's like kind of creating this community where people are all on the same page and, you know, and they're all kind of helping each other and inspiring each other to take risks and, you know, very safe environment to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, for that that three minutes in front of people, that it's a natural human tendency to to really be afraid of of speaking, and you've made it a transformative experience for people. And I love how you stepped in the ego. It's really interesting how you challenge your ego with a question instead of letting your brain take over with that fear response and that defense mechanism. You actually ask the question, "What if I did the opposite?" And then that's a very that's a very powerful uh, way you've kind of jumped and taken a hold of the brain before it could take over you. <laughs> yeah, I feel, you know, there's so many things like that. These just these instincts and, you know, kind of knee jerk reactions. And what I've also realized is that 
by choosing the environments that we submerse ourselves in and by, you know, kind of stopping ourselves in these these types of ways that we, we can actually alter our instincts. We can actually control the instincts that we have. And, you know, it does take time and it takes practice. But over time, uh, you know, I've realized that I can create, you know, habits that are not ego driven and that are, are really habits that I have self-imposed, you know, in my life and, and have control over to say like, you know, this is what I really want. And I don't, because I feel like sometimes these knee jerk reactions are just, they're, they're things that you're like, where did that come from? Like, that's not what I want. That's not the, you know, the reaction that I feel I, I want to have, or that's really me. And, and I think, you know, for whatever reason, these things are there and it's a matter of, you know, trying to figure out how to control them and to serve the purpose that, you know, we each define for ourselves. In your environment, how do you define a high performance team work? Is it is it because you're able to get a potential technology uh, solution set out of your lab and into the commercial environment? Like you're translating a problem set to the commercial application. Is that uh, the checkbox that you're looking for, or is there multiple checkboxes that you're looking for all along the way that the team is measuring against? I'm curious and how you define a win in your environment. I think um, the translational process is quite a, a rocky road and a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers that you hit along the way, some that, that seem even insurmountable, you know, you're just not going to be able to go go past it. And so, you know, the long-term vision for every project in the lab is to be able to, you know, positively impact patients' lives in the shortest period of time. But, you know, often that can be a very long road to do that and with many major roadblocks along the way. And so, you know, kind of realize that, you know, that there's opportunities to get excited and those, you know, we need to have boxes, you know, as you kind of have defined it, you know, along the entire path. And so I think, you know, a, a lot of that for us is, you know, if we can uncover some sort of insight about the problem that others haven't figured out yet, or, or that's just, you know, that's different, that may seem promising to lead us down a direction of, of a technology that, you know, has potential of working, you know, we get excited about that. So that's kind of a box to learn something new that we know is different. I think also, you know, when we encounter a challenge in a particular project, often, you know, you get frustrated and, and angry and try to figure out, you know, maybe we shouldn't advance this. But I think that can also check a box because when you encounter a challenge, it's like an opportunity to be creative and to think differently. And I, I think, you know, in our, our lives, we have so many limitations that are imposed on us by others and ourselves, even, you know, the buildings that we work within. And, you know, we get into these these habits that just are very limiting. And, and so my sense is when we take away those limitations as much as possible, you know, like a, one example is in my laboratory, I've tried to, to have multiple affiliations with different institutions that provides access to resources so we can access tools and different technologies and, and, you know, almost any, anybody, you know, kind of in to engage and to advance beyond things. And that creates excitement. So when you encounter these challenges, if we can then find a collaborator or find a new tool or a new way of thinking that we can go back and test, then that can really like kind of electrify the team. And so I think, you know, to me that that those are the kinds of things that I look for kind of along the way, because I know there's going to be lots of frustration and, and challenges that we hit. And it's important to keep, you know, the team motivated and, and focused on the vision of where we're headed. And I think finding a collaborator who can just help us think a little bit differently can immediately flip something from being, you know, frustrating to something that all of a sudden is exciting again. And so I think that that's also been been a, a big part of it. Is there like a, a like Elon, you know, wants to go to Mars and he wants to have electric cars. So he has these big kind of moonshot things that are very public it, within your lab. Do you have a vision or some a mantra or a mission that you're trying to impact a certain amount of lives? Are you trying to uh, revolutionize or change? Is there some, or is it multiple kind of uh, uh, missions that you have depending on which problem you're solving? I'm really curious to see how you create that environment from like, okay, here's what we're trying to do, everybody, from a leadership perspective. I think that one of the things that, that I've realized is that 
kind of going back to simplicity that, you know, that I needed in my life to have very simple kind of mantras and it, it couldn't be too complicated or involved because it just wasn't, wouldn't kind of, wouldn't fit me, wouldn't fit me, you know? And, and so one of the things that I learned through my mentors in particular, you know, spending time with, with Bob Langer is that one mantra that can really serve well in making decisions is maximize impact. And just those two words, if I think about that constantly, and I really make that the mission of everything we do, that that can help me to make decisions of how to spend my time and and how to engage the process and and really think through the best way of of making decisions. And so I think that, you know, that's kind of how, how I would answer your question is that there there is no, you know, at this point, I mean, we don't have any specific disease focus in the lab and there's no specific technology focus either. It's really focusing on the process of medical problem solving and, and maximizing impact in everything we can do. And so just constantly looking for new problems and getting into new areas where we think we might be able to make an advance or we might be able to uncover some new insights that can guide you know, new ideas for technologies. And so, um, you know, we, we do work in cancer and arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, a bunch of surgical tools, inflammatory diseases and traumatic brain injury. And, you know, we, do, we work in a lot of different areas. I think a big part of that is, is that I, I just love learning about new things. And it's just something that I, I recognize that I need to keep my mind active like that, you know, to be fulfilled, essentially. I and love that. I love that. Yeah. I love the maximum maximize impact because, as you as you were mentioning, you have a wide interest area. And it's sort of as a, a catch-all sieve for you to catch and have a kind of a, a lens that you can siphon. What I love is just from my entrepreneurial brain is that you can constantly ask that question to yourself quietly and it helps you organize where you're putting resources of personal time, energy, and the team. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I mean, I just have a, one example of maximize impact that I've realized has been important as a decision maker is, you know, sometimes we'll publish a, a paper, let's say, and, and, you know, we'll spend a couple of years writing it. Maybe it's like a review paper and, and we publish it in a good journal. And then, and then we'll have a bunch of other journals or, or books reach out to us and say, Hey, we saw you write this, you know, would you do something similar for us? And I used to say yes and, and do those types of things. But as I think about it more, I realize, you know, that that's really not maximizing impact to kind of write the same thing and just kind of reword it. And that what maximizing impact would mean would be kind of starting over and doing something completely different where we can learn something new and, and really critically think through the process and, and then offer some new insights and ways of thinking, you know, for the field. And so I feel like, you know, it's, it's interesting how there's so many others out there who are in groups that are trying to take up some real estate in your mind and to kind of divert some of your efforts into these directions, which may not actually be aligned with what you really want to do. And that's why I feel it's important to personally have a a life strategy and to work on it because as these opportunities, you know, come up and people, you know, pr present things to you to ask you to do certain things, you can then use this concept of maximize impact and, and what's really you've defined for you is really going to be most fulfilling and to make those decisions. Yeah. And that's why I've always loved podcasts because it, uh, the audio format hasn't gone away. I think we all thought radio was going away, but it's just kind of morphed in a different form. And what I love is th these become mentors, you know, as people listen to you talk, they can become, uh, the, the, you know, the quiet mentor in the background because your MTP, your transformational purpose, your maximizing impact that just becomes the catalyst for others that are listening to you. And, and that's really, really powerful. And maybe I thought what a good way to, to wrap up our, our show today Jeff is to re I'd love to ask you a question about about stem cells and about and I know these aren't necessarily related and I'm not a scientist so you can help guide your response but I'd like to talk about stem cells and the gut biome just your thoughts about a particular for example I had my three children I I had uh, the, the I think the thing in 2001 was uh, once the child is born you know, my kids are born. We had we shipped the placenta down to get it stored in some place in Florida for potential use for stem cells. And this was 2001. And I don't know, you know, I asked my wife the other day and I said, we still have those, right? We still have the stem cells stored. She's like, oh, yeah, we get we pay, we pay yearly a fee for that. 
And yeah. and then I I'm really curious about the gut because I I've heard it said that the gut and the research in the gut biome could potentially be uh, as impactful as finding another organ in the human body as far as how it's related to the brain and, and overall health. And I know I'm not a scientist and not everybody listening is a scientist, but I'd love to get from you what your thoughts are in those two areas uh, to leave us with. Sure. I think the field of, of stem cells and regenerative medicine is a you know, really exciting space. I think there's you know, huge opportunities, and uh, some of those are being realized in the potential right in clinical trials right now. I think you know, we have some very, you know, one of the most successful stem cell therapies is hematopoietic um, uh, stem cell transfer or bone marrow transplantation you know, for patients who have anemia or certain types of, of blood cancers where you take the stem cells that can make blood and they end up being a, a therapy that's been you know widely successful has, has a number of complications but that that really has saved a lot of lives and i think that you know it's interesting that you bring up banking of, of placenta and you know also like cord blood has been a big uh, another tissue if you will that's been banked in in quite large numbers and it, it's interesting because Early on, the the sense I think was by the experts in the community is that this would have very limited use because there weren't that many examples where, you know, for, you know, if you have a, a certain blood cancer or if you have a certain type of anemia, that yes, these could help, but um, there are a lot of other conditions that there wasn't any, you know, proof or, or support that uh, stem cells could really help. And so there was a lot of skepticism. And I think what's kind of happened over time is that as the field has evolved, that we've realized that that these that there's a lot of other opportunities for these cells. If you bank them early, you know, with age, our stem cells um, and you know just cells in our body tend to have more defects and 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 um, abnormalities over time through the aging process, and that can be from the environments that we expose ourselves to, as well as genetics. And so, having cells be banked at a very early time, you know, may unlock some potential new approaches that we haven't even thought of yet. And so, for example, I think, you know, that there was banking of these cells and then the whole field of reprogramming came in. And the sense was, I think the data suggests that, you know, if you're going to reprogram cells and use them for regenerative medicine applications, it's best to start with cells as early as possible that don't have any genetic or, you know, other type of environmental type defects. And so, you know, I think think that that space is pretty interesting. You know, there's the whole business side of it as well. And, and, and I think that the business side and the marketing can be such that it, it kind of turns off a lot of academics or some of the you know, experts in the field. But I think over time, you realize that that banking these tissues may actually make more sense than than they did, you know, kind of five or 10 years ago because of the new opportunities that have been unlocked. And I would say in terms of gut microbiome, you know, the field, I think we're just in, in the infancy there. I think we, we know now that the bacteria that inhabit our, our bodies and in particular our GI tract uh, and, and, and specifically in, in the colon can have a lot of interactions with immune cells in our body and with the cells that line our GI tract and, and can actually play a role in several disease states as well as, you know, healthy physiology. And I think it's, it's incredibly complicated because there's so many bacteria and it's like a whole, it's a whole new universe really to explore and there's been a lot of interesting correlations that we found. I think the field is, is kind of at the point now we're trying to figure out, you know, if you remove this specific bacteria, if you add this specific bacteria, can you improve the quality of life of somebody and, and you know, how to think about that on a per patient, um, you know, kind of personalized approach. And I think, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning and uh, there's incredible potential. It's just a matter of kind of unraveling that complexity and really finding opportunities to harness this to improve quality of life of people. Yeah. Thanks for giving everybody such an understanding because separating the marketing hype from, you know, like you're saying, it's a it's a big universe and we're unlocking it. But it's it's not uh, we 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 haven't yet figured everything out. Yes, absolutely. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you for coming on the show today and sharing your approach and and how you are, are able to 
accomplish these these really big big objectives and these through your teams that you put together and your and your, and your thinking and your mentorship it's it's really inspirational and is there anything that you would like to any thoughts that they were triggered during our conversation that you wanted to end with or any any final thoughts on today you know, I've enjoyed this this conversation uh, quite a bit, and and um, thank you for the questions that you've been asking. I always find that you know talking to different people, everyone asks questions differently and and has different um, things that they're interested in asking, and and I feel like that process in and of itself kind of pushes me to to think differently and to think of things that I may take for granted or or may not be kind of at the top of my mind every day, and 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 I I feel like you know that just kind of leads into something I feel is really important important, which is, you know, I'm just constantly experimenting in my life and, and trying to learn from others and, and from trying to unlock, um, you know, the various processes that others use and that I use and just to try to continually improve and, and, and figure out better ways of doing things. And, um, and, and so I think, you know, that's just a big part of it. I feel like, you know, we're never, we're never there. We never reach the, the kind of the, the, the top of the mountain, you know, so to speak, we're always, always climbing up. And I feel like that that's a really exciting place to be. And I'm excited to continue to have conversations like the ones that we just, just had, um, throughout my career to just provide new insights and, and new ways of helping us to advance our mission of, of helping patients in the shortest period of time and, and then also supporting the professional development of, of the people, you know, my laboratory and, and those that I work with. What's really inspirational from what I'm getting and from listeners is just the process that you look at these multiple peaks and these different companies that you've got to market and these different therapies and your teams are developed. It's like so many accomplishments, but you don't look at them as an end in and of themselves. That, and I think that's a really big learning point for, for listeners is that there's a continual ongoing learning process that you never really achieve what you think you're going to achieve. You just move on to the next learning point, the next objective, the next cup. I mean, it, that's, that's life. And that's, it's amazing. Uh, I find to listen to highly accomplished people like yourself, which have this kind of marathon, not sprint mentality. And it's, it's, uh, it's quite refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, trying to shift the focus, you know, clearly we're focused on the end goal of helping patients. But I think by, by really focusing day to day on the process and, you know, different ways that we can maximize our excitement and just uncover new knowledge and, and unlock potential, I think, um, by, by making that the focus, I think it really kind of sets us up for, uh, you know, a long um, career of maximizing fulfillment because we're not just we're not just thinking about the end goal, but we're actually focused on the process along the way and constantly trying to um, improve it and, and um, maximize the excitement we can gain from from uncovering something new. It's been an amazing conversation, Jeff. I really appreciate you for your time and uh, look forward to in the future doing a round two. Sounds great. I look forward to that as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Jeff. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.